Oh, good morning. Good morning, Twain Art Bible Church. My name's Dave Babb, uh, and uh, it's my privilege to be able to bring God's Word to you today. Uh, kind of fun, kind of exciting, uh, this one. Normally when we preach, you know, we preach in a sermon series, but Noel's sermon series on Ruth ended last week, and this is just kind of a one-off. And I thought it'd be easy to pick what I wanted to talk about, uh, but I found it's easier when you're given a passage to run from. But um, it just gave me the opportunity to speak about one of my favorite um, characters from the Bible. Not just characters, it makes it sound like it's a story. You should never say that. One of my favorite men of the Bible. Um, but first, um, I want to share with you a, a little, little anecdote that will get us on our way. Um, many years ago, when I was youth pastor uh, at a church in Folsom, we had a, uh, a couple that was volunteer staff that worked with me. And they were facing a very important decision. I would say a decision all of you have had to make at one time, make at one time or another, and that was on purchasing of a home. Uh, they were very specific about the things they wanted. They had some very good reasons uh, that, that, uh, that the house they would pick would be the right one. They wanted it close to church. They wanted it big enough to host the kids. They wanted, they wanted a swimming pool in the backyard so the youth group could come over and swim whenever they want, uh, which is mostly what I cared about as a youth pastor. Uh, nice not to have to set that stuff up. But um, they were very diligent, especially uh, the wife, very um, particular about what's, what they wanted. And we would often pray for them um, as they were going through this journey of finding the house. Um, we pray for it in our our leadership group, we'd pray for it with the kids. And one week they decided to announce that they had, they had it down to two houses. And that week they were going to pick one of them, but they weren't clear which one it was. And so during that week, they were at one of the houses and it was still a toss up to them. They didn't know. They wanted to make the right way. They're about the same price. Uh, one was a little farther from church, but whoops but close enough. And uh, the wife said, if God would just show us a sign on which one that we would pick, that'd be great. The husband says, well, I don't think God works that way, hon. We shouldn't ask him for that. Not a minute later, four kind of rough-looking biker dudes on Harleys pull up to the driveway across the street. And as they were getting off their bikes, the garage door opened up, and the garage was essentially a man cave biker bar that had instruments set up and amps and so forth. They felt God had given them their sign. <laughs> and it was not to start an outreach to biker bands. <laughs> now we want, how, how, many, how many times have you guys wanted a sign? You had too many options. It seemed like they, all, they were all good, but one of them's right. You can't do all of them. We all want signs from time to time. I tell you, I, I just don't want signs. I've often said I would love to wake up in the morning and on my dresser, there'd be a manila envelope that says, to Dave, from God. And inside it would be a list of things that I needed to do that day, a list of decisions made for me already, a list of people to talk to, a list of people to avoid. Uh, maybe say, hey, don't turn on the news today. You know, some helpful things like that. I, I would love it sometimes that much uh, given for me. <clears throat> I think it'd be awesome uh, if every time we had a decision the, that we had to make, the second we started thinking about it, you kind of look up at the sky and it turned into this, this teleprompter um, from God that would tell us exactly what to do. Well, um, I find it interesting, though, that usually when it comes to times like that, when we would like a sign, it's not the everyday things that we want help with. It's the big decisions. It's, uh, do I move? You know, do I marry this person? Do I, what job should I take? What college should I go to? Um, should I move out of state to get a college? Am I supposed to bail on California right now? Am I supposed to? There's so many things that are big, that we can, we can worry ourselves to death, and sometimes even not make a decision, and staying put was not the right decision to make anyways. 
Sometimes it's just a sign, and there's a problem with signs, and we'll get into that. But we weren't the only ones. Um, today we're going to look at uh, Moses, and if you have your Bibles with you, turn to Exodus 33, starting in verse 12. Moses is, other than Christ, after Christ, of course, my favorite biblical character, my favorite uh, man of the Bible, and I'll tell you why. Um, he's a man that when God offered him the job, he didn't want it. He had a million excuses not to do it. And at the end, the job he didn't want to lead the Israelites, at the end, he was ready to give his life for those people. In between that time, he wasn't encouraged as much as, as you think someone would. The people that he's supposed to be leading got mad at him, turned against him. Even his own family questioned him. His leaders questioned him. He even found out along the way he would not be going to go into the promised land. Yet at the end, through all that, he would have given his life for the Israelites, for God not to take his wrath out on them, but onto him. How do you get like that? It's an amazing story. And today, that's what we're going to get into. <clears throat> At this time, though, um, Moses uh, was asking for, a, uh, asking for a sign in Exodus 33. I'm going to read from my notes. It's a bigger type. <clears throat> Moses said to the Lord, you have been telling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and you have found favor in me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways, so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. The Lord replied, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Then Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked, because I am pleased with you, and I know you by name. Then Moses said, now show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you. <clears throat> I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. Then the Lord said, there is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft of, in the rock and cover you with, the hand, with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will move my hand and you will see my, see my back, but my face must not be seen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much uh, for the promises you made to Moses in this passage, and they're the same ones that you make to us, Father. And that is that you are with us, and you always go out with us, and you know us by name, Father. I pray that as we go through today's uh, lesson, we read about how you crafted that relationship with Moses, Father, that we'll pick up on what it is to be in a relationship with you, Father, and what it means and what, what benefits us, and, and Father, why it's so special and why we need to work on it constantly because there's a lot of people that don't have it that need it. Father, I pray that uh, anything that may distract us from what you would have to say to us today is cleared for our minds and we can concentrate on your words. In your son's name, amen. Okay, so Moses was alone and he was away uh, with God, away for the rest of the Hebrews, and he needed to seek direction. He wanted another divine guidepost, some sort of heavenly gesture for God to let him know he was still on the right path. And it's not that Moses didn't have any indications along the way. Uh, I'm sure you can think, think of many. Uh, he had uh, the burning bush to start it all off. He had, um, uh, they had the manna from heaven. Uh, when they were trying to move uh, away from, from Egypt, he, he turned his, his snake uh, in, into a uh, staff into a snake. All the uh, miracles, the plagues that were performed in order for uh, Pharaoh to get on the ball with them. Uh, a, a pillar of cloud by day to, light them, to, to guide them. A pillar of fire to guide them at night. 
when they were thirsty, they busted open a rock and got water out of it because that's how things work, right? Everyday, uh, everyday accomplishment. And I think we've seen types of things like that in our lives, maybe not quite that dramatic, but the reason we're talking to God in the first place is because he's led us through this. And, and here's what we're seeing right now with Moses is he's continuing that. He needs another sign. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, he wants further clarification at verse 12 and 13. Look, you have told me, lead this people up, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now, I have indeed, if I have indeed found favor in your sight, please teach me your ways, and I will know you and find favor in your sight. Now, consider that this nation is your people. He's clearly asking God to clearly guide and show them what to do. And we all want that, right? We all want to be guided. We want to know that we're doing the right thing. Especially, you know, if, if you're married, especially if you have children and they're watching you, if, if you're the leader of the family, you want them to know that you're making the right thing and that it's because God is guiding you. We're people that are hungry for guidance. We long for direction. We're just like the Israelites in the desert crying out for God many times. <clears throat> Show me the way. Give me a sign. Just, just write it up in the sky so we can see it. But God offered something better than simply guidance to Moses. He promised to be their guide. He promised to be with them. He was not some God that only kind of lived up in, in, the, in the heavenly domains that we don't know, kind of like a Oh, kind of like when, when, when they refer to the force in Star Wars. He wasn't just a, a, a force out there, a, a ball of energy that uh, kind of does what, it's will, what he will. He's a real God. God wouldn't provide handwriting in the sky, but he would offer his hand to Moses and the Israelites to walk with them side by side. And by the way, the Bible never uses the word guidance. And I think that's a good thing because, I don't know, for me, when I hear the word guidance, I think of, like that means suggestions. Here's an idea. Hey, if something works different from you, for you, you go for it. But here's, here's guidance. And I think that can describe a lot of the relationships that we have, a lot of people's relationship with God, that it's just kind of guidance. We got the good book, tells us what to do. Other than that, you know, we kind of figure it out on our own. <clears throat> a guide is always better than guidance. Who remembers the first day of high school? I remember the first day of high school clearly. There was a way to tell, for the most part, who was a freshman on the first day of high school and who wasn't. I wasn't so e uh, easily noticed. I was 6'4 when I started. They just, most people assumed I had transferred to the school. Um, and I, they probably still do this today, but we would get a school folder with the um, logo mascot on the front and you, there was a place to put in some papers, and on the back, what was on the back? A map of the school. And um, even though I had spent a little time uh, that summer at the school between uh, football and band stuff, I had been on the campus that, um, at that time, I didn't know the buildings that well. And so the freshmen, you can always tell, whatever books they were carrying, that, that folder with the map on the back was always right here. And you see someone walking down, <laughs> uh, B3. It's confusing. English 1A's in room B3. It was always so confusing. And, and the people would stop and, oh, this, no, this way. And, and so the people would stop, look down for their guide. Tell them, now, you know what would have been easier? Just someone that said, hey, I'm headed that way. Why don't I, why don't I take you? That would have been a lot easier. And I guess there's some schools that have programs. They kind of have a freshman buddy and stuff like that. There's some schools that do that. <laughs> but uh, it was kind of scary not knowing your way. Even worse when you walked in and sat in a class for 15 minutes before you realized, this ain't my class. You know, that, that also happened too. <clears throat> but I know, maybe there's times when you're new in, in a community and are new at work and um, those places are usually pretty good about letting you know what's going on, but isn't it great to have some nice guy show up and tell you, here, let me, tell, let me show you, what you where you need to go, let me tell you what you need to do. It's always good to have an actual guide. Guidance from Christians, though, comes from our ongoing relationship with God. 
He wants us to know him, being guided by him is part of that relationship. Signs are temporary. A relationship is permanent. Signs can be misinterpreted. They can be misread or even not seen at all. And that's usually because when we go to ask God a question about these big things, we've already decided what we wanted. We're just asking God to bless it, okay? Sometimes God's response is, that's not what's best for you. I got a better idea. This is what you need to... So if you're not in tune with God and you're looking for what you want to see, a sign doesn't do you any good. You're not guaranteed to make the right decision. <clears throat> God wants to lead each step of our journey and not just on the big decisions. And he does the best by walking with us and being in a relationship with us. It was this presence, this relationship that Moses experienced. So when I mentioned before that Moses was my favorite uh, man of the Bible to study, and how do you go from not wanting the job to giving, wanting to give your life? It's because he walked every day with God on that journey. And was that journey a straight line from point A to point B? Nope, it sure wasn't. But what mattered was, was that God was with him. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, if you look back at verse 11, it says, Moses talked to God as he would a friend. This verse speaks to the reality and the depth of the communion between Moses and God. Moses was God's friend, not because he was perfect, not because they shared so much in common, not because Moses was gifted or powerful. They were friends because friends trust each other and they share a common interest. No one could drive a wedge between Moses and God. <clears throat> Moses never knew where he was going with God. God didn't always provide a signpost to direct him, but it doesn't matter. He knew with whom he was going, and that's all that mattered. Moses was a real person who had real encounters with our real God, and the relationship provided him with a direction and guidance as he desired. If we want to know God's will, we must get to know God. There's no other way about it. The guidance hinges on that relationship. If we seek the guide more than guidance, we might just see the sign that we're looking for. And even more, we receive some wonderful, wonderful benefits. <clears throat> and what are those benefits? Well, there are these first four points I'd like you to put down. So if you've got some space there and you're a note taker, we're going to go through four different benefits of a relationship with God uh, this morning. Uh, benefits are a good thing. Benefits uh, such as, uh, I don't know, a nice 401k is pretty good, a, a, a good HMO. Um, if you have a job with an expense account, that's pretty sweet. Um, uh, if you have a good friend or a neighbor that has a beachfront condo that they love to share, that's also a very good benefit. But benefits are important to us. They're, a lot of you have probably picked the job that you have or had because of benefits that came with that job. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, regardless of any of our, our condition or circumstances, God is with us and our situation doesn't change God. He is always going to be with us. And when we're in a particularly tough situation, and I think about Moses and his relationship uh, with God, I usually think, you know, I'm not Moses. Okay? I love to preach about him, I love to share with other people that are going through a tough time. And, and I've heard this said back to me when I'm going through the tough time. Yep, you know, God had that with Moses. Ooh, man, but I'm not, I'm nowhere near Moses. And that's okay if you ever felt that way, uh, because God is always God. And Moses was a regular guy. He just understood these benefits. <clears throat> the first benefit that we have is that in verse 14, we have a companion. Verse 14 says, my presence will go with you. Uh, my presence will go with you. A and um, I'm glad that we're singing more and more hymns lately. And I grew up in a church singing hymns. And uh, I, I love singing hymns. And there's a hymn that was one of the first that really meant something to me more than, you know, just learning the notes and so forth. And that's uh, In the Garden. That's probably my, my favorite um, uh, 
him. And he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me that I am his own. And his joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. Regardless of our condition or circumstance, God is with us. And our situations don't change. God, he will always be with us. The God of Moses, the God of Abraham, the God of Noah is the God of the universe and he walks with us. He's our companion. He's our friend. And when the whole world can walk out on you, when you can be, nowadays I think we all know Christians who are in the workplace who uh, all of them things have become very tough because everybody's opinion is loud and it divides people now. God never walks out on you. God never turns his back on you. God always desires uh, to be our companion. <clears throat> the number two um, uh, benefit that we have here, we find also in verse 14, and that is we experience rest. Again, verse 14 says, and I will give you rest. The rest that is spoken here is a rest that comes while we're on our journey, and it's a rest that reaches to the very core of our, our being. And when I say rest, I'm not saying it's a day off from work. I'm not saying it's a snow day that we get to call in and you can worry about studying for tests later. I'm not saying it's a, it's a paid vacation. Um, it's not just a break from our normal activity. It's a calmness and security that comes through walking with God. And that's important. When we apply rest, being rested, to the world, um, and what happens when you're not rested, you can look up some of the greatest disasters, man-made disasters in history, and it usually became from not being rested. Uh, the first one that popped down mind was the uh, Challenger uh, shuttle disaster. And uh, there was key NASA officials that made a bad decision to go ahead with that launch even though they had worked 20 hours straight and had almost no sleep, they said, you know what, we're good to go. And seven people lost their lives, and it almost killed the, uh, the, the space program for the United States for a while. And uh, especially with, like, industrial accidents. Think of the, the Exxon Valdez when that crashed through the coast and spilled oil all over uh, uh, Alaska. The, the uh, Three Mile Island incident, Chernobyl, uh, even um, even when, uh, remember when uh, Korean Air Flight 007 was shot down over Russia? Someone who was tired and not paying attention to the radar didn't notice they had strayed into Russian territory. All these things happen in the middle of the night with tired people. Now, some of our decisions that we make when we're not rested, if we're not walking with God, may not result in, you know, environmental disasters. It may not uh, result in planes being shot down, but it can result in some really bad decisions in our life that we have to live with. <clears throat> a benefit of living in God's presence is that we can snuggle up close to our Heavenly Father. Um, I love the stories of uh, Corrie ten Boom. Does it, anybody know who Corrie ten Boom is? She wrote uh, books a long time ago. She was a Dutch woman whose um, family used to hide Jews in um, World War II. And eventually they got caught for him, put in jail. <clears throat> and she would have a saying. She would say, don't wrestle, just nestle. That's the time when we're at our most insecure, when we don't know what's happening. That's when we're supposed to be feeling that rest and that peace. A <clears throat> benefit of living God's present is knowing that we can rest confident and secure and always victorious. Number three. We will be distinguishable. Verses 15 and 16 says, in your, if, if your present does not go, your people will be distinguished by this from all the other people on the face of the earth. <clears throat> I suppose we all desire to be distinguishable and, and set apart from the rest of society. Uh, God's presence does that in our lives. Because of God's presence, we are holy people. We're set apart and we're distinct. When we come into God's presence, we're on holy ground and we are set aside one day a week. 
uh, the Sabbath as a holy day. Now, the point of of this text is that because of the accompanying presence of God, we are holy people. We aren't holy because we are different in how we spend our Sunday mornings. We're not different maybe because, I don't know, we'll take our family on a missions trip instead of a regular vacation. We're not different by how we spend our money if we choose to spend our money uh, giving it to church. What makes us different is God's presence accompanying us. We're not different because of what we do, but rather because of what God does in and through us. A holy person takes God's accompanying presence seriously. And think about it. If we are consciously aware of God's presence, it's going to impact our talk, our behavior, and our thoughts. It's kind of like hanging out socially with the pastor. Not not completely unlike that. Uh, I know many times over the years uh, as a youth pastor, um, a lot of kids, and I'll be honest, sometimes the parents, um, will be driving someplace or just kind of hanging out, and they'll say something. Uh, maybe it's a bad word, maybe it's a piece of gossip, whatever. They go, oops, Dave, sorry, I didn't mean for you to hear that. And, uh, and I, I'm glad that they know me that way, uh, but I usually tell them, well, okay, but you know, I'm not the one you need to be uh, apologizing to. You know, we kind of go over that. <clears throat> but I've got that quite a bit uh, in my experience as a pastor. Um, let's see. Um, I lost my place. Please, please. Oh, yes. God's accompanying presence causes us to think different and act different and talk different and love different uh, because our society is not set up to love people that are different from us right now. It's easy not to. It's easy to laugh at certain things people say and make jokes and share memes, um, but that's not loving the lost people. Um, Someone recently put up a little uh, Facebook little saying that has stuck with me because usually I don't don't get into, we used to call it bumper sticker theology, but no one puts bumper stickers on their cars anymore. Um, But they put up the saying that says, you'll never look anybody in the eye God doesn't already love. And that's true. And I've thought about it several times uh, over the last month and been kind of ashamed of myself. But the accompanying presence of God calls us to stand out in a crowd, to be distinct, separate, and unusual. He calls us to be different. And if loving people who believe things very differently than us doesn't make us stick out, even though they don't care, even though at first that may not be something that sticks out to them, they think we're weak for doing something like that, That's what the presence of God does in our lives. Number four, benefit of relationship with God. We will be known. The Lord answered Moses, I will do this very thing you have asked, for you have found favor in my sight, and you know me by name. That's in verse 17. Can you imagine being known by God? When we're sitting here, Sunday mornings, listening to me talking about Moses, Noel talking about uh, Ruth, all these people that we've come to know and love and respect and just look upon as these people in the Bible that because of what they went through, you know, we can have a relationship with God um, that we do. They seem so different, so special, but we're as special to God as anybody that he mentions in the word. We came to know him and he comes to know us. Does that give you significance in your life? I hope it does. The creator of the universe knows us by name. It is said that uh, God knows the number of hairs on each of your head. Not only does he know the number of hairs, but he's been doing the math for years as the numbers went down. (laughs) And he keeps up on that. To me, I like that I'm known, especially by God. And I think there's been times in our life where people are looking for significance. That's why TikTok is such a thing. That's why Instagram, uh, when you see a news story, Instagram star, insert name here because, who, you know, I guess someone knows them. If they have a million followers, someone knows them. But people desire to be known. And you know what? That can temporarily be okay. Um, I've got three sisters. Uh, I, I'm the oldest in my family, but I've got three sisters. Um, one sister, Lori, she's twins with my brother Dan, and uh, 
They're 22 months younger than me. So I had the great privilege of attending high school two years with a younger brother and sister. Um, they were freshmen when I was a junior in high school. Um, when I was a junior in high school, I was kind of known at my school because I was a large galoot of a giant uh, that walked the halls. Uh, I was starting my junior year. I was probably 6'6", six, 6'7", six, six, right around there. Now, my sister Lori is a very pretty girl who always got lots of attention from boys. And you know how boys are at that age. Some can be real attracted to a young lady but not say a word because they're totally afraid. Some guys are a little too forward now and then with their attraction to a young girl. And when my sister, my sister was also tall. She was 5'10 by the time she got into, uh, she was a freshman. And she got a lot of attention. And some guys were, I guess, nice about it. And, and some guys would, hey, you see that Lori Bad? She's something else. Oh my goodness, look at her. You know, I'm good. And then that person would be stopped and said, do you know who her brother is? They said, who? Like, yeah, that guy, that guy walking by right there. And so uh, my sister didn't get hit on a lot in high school. And she'll tell you she was fine with that. She wasn't, she wasn't looking for high school boys anyway at that time. She, she ended up marrying an older man. <clears throat> but um, for the two years that I wasn't there, she was still hands off. I hadn't moved away yet. I was still living in the town. And it still carried on the two years after, which kind of made me, okay, well, you know, made an impact there with some young men, good. Now, my youngest sister, her name's Julie, she's 11 years younger than me. Okay, by the time she got in high school, I had already moved out. I was a youth pastor in Folsom, California. I lived 150 miles away. And um, there was a young man who she was starting to date. This young man played football. And uh, one day, our coach Johnson was talking to this man. His name was Brandon. And he says, um, so I see you're starting to uh, get interested in Julie Babb. He goes, yeah, she's, she's, a, she's, a, good, she's a good girl. She, she really is. She's really nice. And he says, okay, have you met her brother Dave yet? And he says, uh, no. He goes, he's a monster. <laughs> <coughs> I hadn't been at that school for almost 12 years, and my reputation, thank you, Coach Johnson, uh, was, was still uh, in, in check there. Um, she dated the guy for a little while, but that's not the man that, that she married. But you know what? I felt a little proud that 12 years later, not being there in such a long time, I still had, had somewhat of a, I'll say, good reputation if it kept weirdos away from my sisters. That was always good. Um, but that pales in comparison to being known by God. Because I got no more sisters. Uh, the, the legend of Dave Babb, I'm sure, is far over since my graduation 30 <laughs> years ago. And, um, but I will forever be known by God. <clears throat> it's hard to explain, but to have someone great know who you are brings a sense of significance to life. Um, just recently on YouTube, because I was watching Warriors highlights, pops up uh, when Stephen Curry hit his uh, record for three-point shots in a career, and all these legends just started talking about it. It must make you feel wonderful. But God knowing my name, that's going to make anybody and any relationship ever thought of by anybody that's ever lived on earth just pale in comparison. God is the greatest one in the entire universe. He knows me by name. In fact, he knows everything about us. And still, he wants to be our companion. And as we've established, we have all had times when we want a sign to point us in the right direction, to have God show us something that means that unmistakably, unmistakably we have made the right decision. And the thing is, he has given us signs. They're, they're not road signs. They're not billboards. It's not skywriting that shows us where our future is. His signs are what he's gone through with us in the past. These signs have been here all along. They are there, but sometimes we don't see them. When we're walking with God, when his presence accompanies us, his signs are all around us. So what are those signs? If you, got, if you didn't write too big on your sheet there, 
And three signs that God shows us. One, in verse 18, the sign of his glory. Then Moses said, please let me see your glory. The glory of God is the weighty importance and the shining majesty that accompanies God's presence. The heavens declare it. Creations witness it. Churches embodies it. Churches reflect it. The glory of God is all around us. Moses came to understand, sense, and see God's glory. But Moses did not see the entirety of God's glory, glory, and neither will we. Number two is the sign of his goodness. Verse 19, and the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you. The word goodness refers to uh, the manifestation of essence or, or God's glorious attributes, most often thought of as the work of his hands. The goodness of God is the concrete experience of what God has done and is doing in the lives of his people. Moses experienced the goodness of God time and time again, but he did not witness all the goodness of God. And the third sign is the sign of his grace. The Lord said, I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. The grace of God is his, is his unmerited favor and, and an expression of his heart. God's heart is one of love and compassion. Many times on our journey, we may have deserved justice, but God chose to give us grace. Instead of getting what we deserve, he grants us favor. The embodiment, that, that's the absolute embodiment of his grace. We as people are the recipients of his grace, but not all of his grace. Now, here's the interesting thing about um, the signs of God, his, his glory, his goodness, and his grace. Most often as God is leading us, we don't see these signs till afterwards. Sort of like looking in the, in the rearview mirror of our lives. We see how God has shown up performing his work. We look back, and we, we look back seeing how God has caused a bad situation to work out for our good. We see an event play out and remark, only God could have done that. We reflect on an unfolding series of happenings and know that those pieces could have only been put together by the hand of God. Was God working? We took the tragedy of others and then the blessings in our own lives and we say, there but for the grace of God go I. If you've ever said that, I hope you truly mean it not just to talk about how much someone's situation is awful, but how blessed that you truly are. God says, you see these signs all the time. My goodness, my grace are all around you. But you want a visible, I'm uh, sorry, a visible, a visible appearance, which is called a theophany. That is when God is a physical manifestation. He said to Moses, do the following. Here's a place near me. You are to stand on the rock. And when my glory passes by, I will put you in the crevice of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take my hand away and you will see my back, but my face will not be seen. Moses did as he was instructed. He stood in the crevice of the rock. God passed by a visible appearance, this time in human form. And Moses saw him, not his face, but his back. So we too, when we're led by God, We don't see God's face. That'll happen one day. But right now, we don't see God's face. We see his back. And why is that? We cannot see his face because we cannot see him coming. We see God's back because we see where he has been and what he has done in the past. We do not anticipate or second-guess God. It is only after a long reflection that we're finally struck with what God has been doing all along. It's been my experience that God does not always point the way, but he leads the way. Are you good with that? Are you good with someone just leading the way? We, we want more sometimes, don't we? Why do you turn here? Why do you turn here? We don't ask God that because the journey of our lives will look much like switchbacks going up a mountain. It's never a straight line, but there's a reason God takes us through that. There are many in this room who could speak for hours about how God has led them through life through good times and through the hard times. 
And I pray that those of you who have those stories get the chance to share those often with people. For those who don't have God walking with you, for those who do not know that the rest that, that comes from God and a relationship with God, I pray that you do something about that sooner than later. You do it today. If this is something that sounds good to you, know that it can be for you. You may think, well, if God knows me, he's probably not bragging about me. That's okay. I don't know how often God brags about me. I don't think he does because we stumble far, far more often than we soar. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing to have this relationship with God, to have the creator of the universe walk with you and be your friend. And he gives you other friends that want to see you succeed too. So if you have not made that decision yet in your life, I pray that you do that today. You can come talk to me. I'm more than happy to. There's lots of people in this room that love to talk with you. We have Nate and, and Noel in the back. They're elders. That's kind of their job. That's what they're supposed to do. And, uh, but they love doing it. So I would encourage you to do that today. I would encourage you as you go home today, and if you decompress on this at all, just think about the blessings that God has given you along the way. And maybe if you're not feeling it right now, then uh, get straight with God. Ask him how that's going to continue. Because God's waiting. He didn't turn you away. He didn't leave you stranded on the side of the road. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all the ways that you show us your love. Father, we thank you that despite your incredible goodness and grace and glory, Father, you want to have a relationship with us, people who have done nothing of ourselves to, to deserve it, Father. I pray that that mercy and grace that you show us that we can lavish on other people who need it terribly, Father. I pray that we uh, spend time in your word and in prayer with other Christians so this becomes easier for us. We can reach a world that needs you so bad. In your son's name.